Hello and welcome into another episode of Lockdown Wolves. Today on the show, we're talking lineup data. Could we see more two-point guard lineups after it worked really well? The Wolves come back against the Knicks almost almost all the way, come back against the Knicks on Monday. We'll talk McLaughlin and Conley together on the floor. Plus, checking in on the big man rotation. What is the Wolves' best big man Two big man pairing to this point. Also checking in on Ant's shot selection, which has been a bit iffy of late. We'll also look at Wolves Pelicans Wednesday night. It's all upcoming. Welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves. Your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Lockdown Wolves podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Lockdown Wolves. Today's episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use the code LOCKDOWN for $20 off your first purchase. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Happy Hump Day. Happy Game Day. The Wolves take on the New Orleans Pelicans back at home tonight for Wolves Pels as Minnesota looks to secure the season series against Zion Williamson and the Pelicans. We'll talk about that toward the end of the show. Lots of stuff to get to early, though. I want to talk lineup data, both point guard lineups, uh, multiple point guard lineups, the multiple big lineups that the Wolves almost always trot out. And then also I want to talk a little Anthony Edwards shot selection. So a bunch to get to here today um, leading into Wolves-Pelicans tonight. A big thank you here off the top, though, for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. You can also watch the show on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. All right. Um, let's start with some with some lineup data. So Wolves Knicks on Monday, New Year's Day afternoon from Madison Square Garden. The Wolves are down 22 points in the third quarter. And Jordan McLaughlin gets inserted into the game as uh, I I think actually at first, I don't think when he first came on the floor, it it was a two point guard lineup, but no, it wasn't. It was midway through the third quarter. He comes into the game. The Wolves are down 21. They get it down to 14. Eventually it's down, you know, it's a 16 point deficit by the end of the third to start the fourth quarter though. Chris Finch decides to go two point guards with both Mike Conley and Jordan McLaughlin on the floor. Uh, They play essentially and eh, six ish, five and a half minutes together. Conley leaves and then comes back. McLaughlin leaves uh, for the rest of the game, but there for the first almost half of the fourth quarter, Conley and McLaughlin shared the floor together. It was the first time all season that those two had shared the floor with uh, what I would call otherwise the regular starting lineup. Like they were on the floor with the starters minus Anthony Edwards. Prior to Monday, Conley and and um, Jordan McLaughlin had only shared the floor for 11 total possessions as tracked by cleaning the glass. And then they shared the floor for eight possessions as tracked by cleaning the glass um, on Monday alone. And previous to that, it had not gone well. And, and it had been some sort of mix and match, like usually Nas Reed was on the floor. Um, but it wasn't, they had not shared the floor yet with both Towns and Gobert at any point this season. And in those eight possessions, they were really, really good. Maybe not surprisingly, the Timberwolves didn't turn the ball over at all with those two on the floor together over those eight possessions. They also held the, you know, it's absurd to look at like points per hundred possessions over eight possessions, but you know, those eight possessions were a plus 87.5 differential. um, If you look at that extrapolated out over hundred possessions. So overall, the, the two point guard lineups together are, you know, uh, in 19 possessions, a minus 5.3 painfully small sample. But with McDaniels, Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert, it was a very successful lineup, at least for, you know, roughly the first half of the fourth quarter on Monday. Is that something Chris Finch would look to do on a more regular basis? Now, I, 
the Pelicans on Wednesday, that's actually, it's a tough matchup. The Pelicans are such a tough matchup for anybody because they do a little bit of everything. They've got the bruiser and the Peyton Valanciunas. They've obviously got Zion who like, you know, is a little bit of everything with what he does himself. And then you've got length and Ingram. You've got volume scoring for in a, in a guard and a ball handler in CJ McCollum. It's just an interesting mix of players to try and, and go against. Um, and the last time out, we'll talk about this later. The Wolves lost by 14 to a full strength Pelicans team. So it's a tough matchup for anybody, but there could be a time and a place for Jordan McLaughlin. Like it is, I mean, not that like you're playing matchups strictly with Jose Alvarado, but I mean, Jordan McLaughlin's kind of a better version of Jose Alvarado, right? There's a lot of similarities there. Uh, maybe he sees some actual backup minutes at the point guard spot there. I don't know that a two point guard lineup against the Pelicans necessarily makes sense, but maybe McLaughlin getting, you know, those backup backcourt minutes instead of Troy Brown Jr. makes sense. Uh, again, I, I don't think you can give up that size by having two point guards on the floor against the team with, you know, Herb Jones and Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson and all this length that's out there. But it may just be no Troy Brown and obviously no Shake Milton, who's been out of the rotation anyway. Those guys are on the bench. Instead, it's Jordan McLaughlin in the game as like your ninth rotation guy. Maybe we're just at the point in the season where there's a clear, I'll even just call it a top seven. I don't know that I'd even call it a top, you know, top eight. Like Kyle Anderson is probably at this point still the eighth guy. But like you look, you look at your starting five and you've got Nikhil Alexander Walker and you got Nas Reed. That's your top seven. Chris Finch is at, we're at the point in this season. And I realize I'm talking about the Wolves like they aren't still the number one seed in the West, but we've seen a few bumps here recently. Kyle Anderson's been a real liability offensively. Um, I don't want to get too far down this path right now because this isn't the topic I'm on, but Kyle Anderson's turnover rate is, is out of control. Like I've been saying this for a while. He's not only is he not making shots and teams just aren't guarding him, but he's not taking care of the ball either. And he's been fine defensively, and he's had good moments. He, he had a couple nice strips of Julius Randle in the next game on Monday. Helped the Wolves kind of stay in it. But his offensive performance has been miserable this year. And it's hard for me to even say, like, oh, he's a surefire. Like, could some of Kyle Anderson's minutes go to Jordan McLaughlin? I mean, he, Kyle Anderson's kind of the de facto distributor, facilitator, if you will, almost a, a point forward with that second unit. Depending on matchups, could those minutes just kind of get shifted to Jordan McLaughlin? I realize we're talking about one game, you know, a 10, 12 minute stint for McLaughlin, but we're also talking about a player who's one of the league's best at avoiding turnovers. And the Wolves have been one of the league's worst teams at avoiding turnovers here of late, which is a topic we're going to talk about it actually on today's Minnesota basketball party. We're going to talk about the turnover issues. I'm going to talk about how, you know, the body of work so far this year, the turnovers aren't good. They've been much worse recently. Um, but earlier in the year, it was the other guys that were the bigger issue. More recently, it's been Anthony Edwards, Carl Anthony Towns, the guys who actually, for as much as the ball's in their hands, they do a, an okay job at avoiding turnovers. But recently, they've been really bad. Earlier this year, it was Kyle Anderson. It was Shake Milton. It was these guys that aren't your star players who were just, frankly, too turnover prone for what the roles are supposed to be. Um, and Jordan McLaughlin helps solve that, right? Like, he's going to take care of the basketball. If nothing else, he's going to take care of the basketball and he's going to be at least a high energy defender, if nothing else. Right. Um, so I like I don't think Jordan McLaughlin's going to have a massive role. I don't think he's even an every night rotation guy at this point. I just think depending on certain matchups, and if it's a if it's a game where Chris Finch thinks he can steal some minutes with Conley and McLaughlin together, you know the offense is going to run well with those guys on the floor. And the other three guys on the floor with them are going to get plenty of opportunity with the ball in their hands. And in the case of the game the other day, it was actually Jaden McDaniels, Carl Anthony Towns, and Rudy Gobert, which meant it was just a lot of cat with the ball in his hands, which is a good thing, right? Um, so I think we do, there's a real potential to seeing more Jordan McLaughlin on the floor here moving forward, at least in the near term. Um, I want to talk more about the big man rotation. Some pretty interesting stuff here. I want to go down each of the 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 main two big pairings, right? Uh, cat and Rudy, obviously. Um, Kat and Nas together and Rudy and Nas together and talk about what those lineups look like, what the numbers look like for each of those pairings to this point in the season. So we're going to do all that here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at FanDuel. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets 
win or lose. The app is extremely easy to use. There are so many different ways to bet. You can play live same game parlays. You can find bets in the new Explore tab. You can also make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays. You can also just bet straight up the uh, the or a bet against the spread, I should say. The Wolves take on the Pelicans, of course, tonight. We'll talk about that preview later. The Wolves are actually favored by six and a half points at home against New Orleans. A couple of reasons why I think that's the case. I still think that line's a bit big. Um, I'm not at all advocating for you to bet against the Wolves, but that six and a half feels a little bit steep to me. Anyway, go check it out at FanDuel. See if there's any movement on that line between the time I'm recording this and tip on Wednesday. Uh, visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and make your first bet an absolute layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. But Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. All right, let's talk big man rotation. And then I want to get into the Anthony Edwards shot selection because I, that's a that's a topic I want to get to today as well. So the big man rotation, all the numbers are really good, as you might expect for a team that is sitting there at you know number one in the Western Conference, still more than a third of the way through the season. Uh, let's just go down the list here. So what I did is I went to cleaning the glass. I searched um, lineups that had both Rudy Gobert and Carlton Towns on the floor first, and not surprisingly, of the pairings. That is the best Tim Wolves two-man pairing. Cat and Rudy on the floor together, regardless of who the other players are. And technically, I didn't exclude the third big. So, like, this includes those minutes they played with Nas, which is like, you know, what, 16 possessions or something throughout the year. So, at this point, Rudy and Cat together on the floor, over 1,310 possessions, 1,310 possessions. Those lineups are a plus 9.8 points per 100 possessions. That's 90th percentile league wide. And and just a reminder, I've said this before, but I'll I'll quick the the what that means is if you look at the cleaning the glass definition, the percentile rank is compared to all lineups that have played at least 100 possessions together. Um league wide. So not specific to Timberwolves lineups. Um so again, that's a plus what did I say plus 9.8 in th- in 1310 possessions of Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert together on the floor. And obviously they played the most possessions together of any of the of any of the big pairings. And of course, their most used lineup together is the Wolves' preferred starting lineup with Anthony Edwards and Jade McDaniels and Mike Conley on the floor together. That one is actually only a plus 5.6, 59th percentile. The best lineup that's been used with any real frequency is their third most, well, I should say their second most used lineup is also good. That's that same lineup, but with Alexander Walker instead of McDaniels. Topic for another day, side note, a lot of these lineups look better with Naw on the floor than they do with Jaden McDaniels on the floor. Just saying that, we'll get back to it at some point. Their third most used lineup is their best one in 121 possessions, which is, you know, roughly a quarter of, of the number of possessions that, you know, as, as their most used lineup, the Wolves starting lineup. This lineup with Mike Conley, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Troy Brown Jr., Carl Anthony Towns, and Rudy Gobert and 121 possessions is a plus 32.1. That's 96th percentile among all lineups that have used at least 100 possessions this year. That is, um, that's impressive. And that's a lineup that has a crazy amount of length, just like the regular starting lineup. But it's also notable because there's no Anthony Edwards. And the offensive rating for that particular lineup is okay. The defensive rating is unbelievable. 92.7 points per 100 possessions. That's a 98th percentile defensive rating. The offensive rating is, is, again, still good. It's Well, actually, I say that. It's actually better than the ones with Anthony Edwards in it. It's it's 76 percentile, 124.8 points per 100 possessions. So that lineup is insanely good with Townsend Gobert on the floor together. Now, if we if we uh, that if we look at the next best lineup in terms of two man uh, two big pairings, I should say, Rudy Gobert and Nas Reed together so far this season are the Wolves' next best two big pairing, and they're not far behind, plus nine point five, so just slightly behind the plus nine point eight that Rudy and Cat have together. This is in less than half as many possessions. It's in only six hundred nine possessions. That's an eighty ninth percentile lineup 
so far this season. Rudy and Nas on the floor together. Their most used lineup is only 87 possessions, and it's with Ant at the point guard spot. Nikhil, well, actually, Nikhil Alexander-Walker at the point guard spot. So Alexander-Walker and Edwards in the backcourt. Kyle Anderson at the three with Nas and Gobert have played 87 possessions to a plus 6.8. Their best lineup is just 56 possessions, and that's what you might expect. It's the starting lineup with Nas in there instead of Cat. So Conley, Edwards, McDaniels, Reed, and Gobert is a plus 30.8 in just 56 possessions. The third combination is Cat and Nas together. Not nearly as good as the other two, but still solid. Like still a, a, a good enough lineup, right? They're a plus 4.8 in 658 possessions. So Cat and Nas have played together about 50 possessions, 49 possessions to be exact, more than Rudy and Nas have played together. This is still a 75th percentile lineup. So again, um, plus 4.8 overall. Their most used lineup is Ant, Alexander Walker, Kyle Anderson, Cat and Nas. So it's basically the bench plus Cat and Ant. And we see this lineup almost every night. 132 possessions. They're only a plus 1.4, which is 46th percentile uh, among lineups. And again, that's the most used lineup with Cat and Nas together. Their best lineup is actually with Anthony Edwards, Kyle Anderson, and Shake Milton together. And that's a plus 42.7 and 39 possessions. So very small sample there. Um, so again, Rudy and Cat together, awesome. Rudy and Nas together, not far behind. Cat and Nas together, still good, but the least good of the three. Now, the t amount of time that each of those bigs have, has had on the floor as the lone big as a center, much, much, much less frequently. Rudy's the most used, 214 possessions on the floor with no Cat and no Rudy. The Wolves are a plus 2.4 in those minutes. That's 64th percentile. Interestingly, Cat in only 104 possessions, the Wolves are a plus 10.2 with Cat at center and no Rudy on the floor and no Nas on the floor. That's 91st percentile. Only 104 possessions, but a plus 10.2. The worst one is a small ball lineup with Nas at the five. The Wolves have actually played. This surprised me. 167 possessions this way. And I would have to imagine that these almost all would have come in, what, the one game that Cat missed and then, um, you know, a couple others where, you know, he got hurt at, towards the end of one game before that. Uh, he's been, you know, I guess in foul trouble occasionally when he's in foul trouble and Rudy's taking a rest. Like, otherwise, why would the Wolves do this? But with Nas at center and no cat and no Rudy on the floor, in 167 possessions, the Wolves are actually a minus 15.7. So of all these combinations, they're all positive. No matter how you slice and dice it, turns out the Wolves are the one seed in the West, except for Nas only on the floor, Nas at center. But beside that, this has been a, a you know, Chris Fitch has pushed all the right buttons and, and done all the right stuff around these bigs. I don't know that there's like a, a, you know, a massive takeaway here other than the Wolves have three really good bigs and they all play really well together. And I, I guess, you know, Rudy, Rudy is the best of the three of them in terms of what the plus minuses are numbers are telling us this year, what the, um what the, uh, the, the lineup data is telling us. Um, but also when Rudy is off the floor, Playing Cat by himself in a very small sample has been actually more successful than playing Cat with Nas. So what that means is, uh, by the way, that also means Kyle Anderson is probably at the four in most of those lineups. Um, and so that's just a function. Slow-mo is better at the four than he is at the three. He has been throughout his career, going back to his days in San Antonio and Memphis. So um, maybe it's simply when Cat's getting a break, get Nas on the floor with Rudy. Um, when Rudy needs a break, put Cat at the five, put Kyle Anderson at the four, and even trim back a few of those Nas minutes. And I think this could be dependent on the matchup too. I'm not at all advocating for overall less Nas minutes. I'm just saying, depending on the matchups, maybe getting slow mo at the four and allowing him to, you know, to play more minutes where he's more comfortable and more effective, that could overall be better too. And it could allow you to steal more Troy Brown minutes here and there, depending on the matchup. Um, if you can get away with playing just a little bit smaller. And, you know, that just play cat at the five, like, like basically what the wolves did for long chunks of most of cats career. Um, and by that, I mean, he did play the five for most of his career, but as like the lone big, right. There's been so many years where the wolves effectively had two centers on the floor together. I think that got lost in the shuffle, whether it was Gorgie Jang or Taj Gibson functioned like a center offensively. Right. Um, but to, to really have cat on the floor as the only big with Kyle Anderson at the four, that is a successful lineup in, in a lot of cases. And, and 
it's an option for Chris Finch. If, if Nas is not playing well or if Rudy's in foul trouble or needs to a break or whatever, um, it, it's something Chris Finch can go to a little bit more often because those lineups have been really good, albeit during in, in a pretty short sample. All right. Um, let's close the show here today. I, I want to talk about Ant's shot selection. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this today. It's something that we're going to keep an eye on and come back to here soon. And then we'll touch on briefly the Wolves-Pelicans matchup as well. And that's how we'll close out the show here today. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our title sponsors over at Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry when you buy tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Plus, their all-in prices show you your total upfront, so you know what you're getting, and you know you're getting a great deal before you even check out. Game Time is absolutely obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets. They have exclusive flash deals and sponsored deals on tickets for everything, not just sports, but also concerts, comedy, theater, and more. I like to attend all types of events. Um, I'm obviously a huge sports fan, but I also love comedy shows. I love going to the theater. Um, whatever it is, Game Time is the best place, especially now here if you're looking to do something fun. Once we're past the holidays, looking to do something fun, just you, just uh, you know, you and some buddies, you on a date night, whatever. Um, now that we're done with all of the, all of the things that come with the holidays game time is the best place to go to get your tickets. You can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time, download the game time app, create an account and use the code locked on for $20 off your first purchase terms apply again, create an account and redeem the code locked on L O C K E D O N for $20 off download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, real quickly, let's talk about Anthony Edwards' shot selection so far this season. Um, so if you take a quick glance at what Ant's numbers look like overall, obviously he's having a career year. There's no question about it. And like, no matter how you slice it, he's been better on both ends of the floor than he ever has been in his career. I want to get that out of the way. The most impressive thing to me thus far, and I should say this first, just so people don't, don't get this twisted. Like, he's fantastic. He's great. I'm just trying to take him from... Like last year, he was good and he made it his first All Star team, and and I thought maybe the the improvement was a little more incremental than a lot of people realized. Because anyway, that's another topic. But this year, he's taken something of a leap. His assist rate is up five and a half points, five and a half points, and his turnover rate is actually down this season. I know that's surprising because it feels like he's been turning over like crazy, and lately he kind of has been um, too much, right? But still, if you look at the body work over twenty nine games. He's actually turning it over less than he did last year from a rate perspective. All well, his assist rate's gone up five and a half points and his usage rate has gone up almost three full points. That's crazy. That's crazy. He's getting to the line a lot more often. Um, if you just look at it at free throw attempts per game, which is not the right way to look at it, but maybe the best tangible for just like saying on a podcast, his free throw rate is up, but his free throw attempts per game, he's shooting one and a half more attempts per game and he's shooting them 9% better at the line than he did last year. That's basically an extra point and a half a game just at the free throw line. I mean, he is, he, he's making literally 1.7 free throws more per game. The volume is up and the percentage is up in terms of free throw attempts. That's massive. My nitpick with what he's doing so far this season. And it, and it would be great if the turnover rate came down a little bit and it was down until here recently. My nitpick is that he's exchanged some of those three-point shots for mid-range shots. And we talked about this a little bit earlier this year, but I want to give some additional context to that. Uh, like, for instance, he's only shooting about 35% of his shot attempts from three-point range this year. Actually, about 3% less of his shot attempts are coming from outside the arc than they were last year. His attempts from 10 to 16 feet have more than doubled in terms of frequency, which 10 to 16 feet, like, I mean, a good chunk of those are actually coming in the paint right? It's basically middle of the paint to just above the free throw line. That's not a bad area of the floor to shoot if you're really good at making those shots. Like it's better than the 16 footer to, to the three point line. He's shooting a few too many of those, but that number is not up crazy drastically over last year. He's basically taken most of those three point attempts and he's now shooting them 
in the 10 to 16 foot range. And by the way, he's actually shooting the ball less at the rim than he was last year. He's getting to the line more often, but he's, he's overall, his actual shot attempts are less at the rim. Probably a combination of he's shooting more from the 10 to 16 foot range, more from the, the pull up range area. And he's getting fouled more. So those obviously aren't being logged as field goal attempts unless they're and once, right? Um, his percentage, by the way, is up at the rim, which is great. And that's, that's another positive so far this year. Uh, and, and again, it's almost all entirely positive for Ant. The problem is last year, he was shooting seven and a half percent of his shots from 10 to 16 feet. Over 14% of his shots now are coming from that range on the floor. And he's only shooting 40% from the 10 to 16 foot range. Compare that to, and this is unfair because it's Kevin Durant, but I'm going to anyway, compare it to Kevin Durant, who hasn't shot below 50% from 10 to 16 feet since 2017-18 and has shot over 50% from that range in six out of the last eight seasons. Kevin Durant is almost 48% for his career from 10 to 16 feet. And last year shot 59.1% from there. Like, uh, you know, and, and you can pull the various mid-range assassins, if you will. Chris Paul, uh, Devin Booker is another good example if you want to take more, you know, current and recent members of the Phoenix Suns. Um Guys like that are in the 50% range from that spot on the floor. Because here's the thing. Anthony Edwards is shooting 38% from three, 37.9% from three. So which would you rather have him do? Shooting a 38% three-point shot or a 40% two-point shot? Well, I don't know. It doesn't take a mathematician to figure that one out, right? And I get the importance of the mid-range game. I, I get that it can keep teams off balance. I get that Ant can get off a shot anytime he wants. And I know that he is a overall, a good and impressive mid range jump shooter, but 40% from 15 feet, which is often contested in some way, more so than a three pointer is worse than 38% from outside the arc. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot worse. So Anthony Edwards, if he could just take, call it two of those less per game and make them three pointers, his scoring average goes up. I'm not going to do that math accurately right now, but probably a couple points a game, right? If you assume that he's shooting 40% here and 38% there, at least a couple points a game. If that, you know, over the course of, or, or, you know, the rest of the season, we'll call it. So just, a, and I'm, I guarantee you, Chris Finch and the Wolves coaching staff is in his ear about that because they're well aware of the math there. Like they, they know, they know everything. I, they know all this stuff. If they could just get him to shoot a little bit more outside the arc and a little bit less, uh, around the elbows. And I know it feels like he shoots a lot of threes. His three point attempt rate is the lowest of his career by far. It's not even close. And it's been going down each of the last two years. If you, again, if you just want to look at it attempts per game, um, he's only shooting 6.8 three point attempts per game. His next lowest was his rookie year, 7.2 three point attempts per game. So he shooting his lowest volume three point at any point in his career, but his percentage is the highest. And it's not just simply because he's taking better shots. He's just make, he's just shooting less threes and he's a better shooter. He's got to shoot more threes because he's a better shooter than he was three years ago. All right. Last thing on the show here today, and, and we will talk more ant shot selection. That's something we'll get to later. Uh, you know, multiple times here over the course of the season. In fact, I'll probably do a whole show on it at some point here soon uh, because there's a lot to get into there. Um, Wolves Pelicans, of course, the last time the Wolves faced the Pels here a couple of weeks ago was the first game of this gauntlet and New Orleans beat Minnesota by 14 points in New Orleans. It was a game that was a little closer than that, um, but Zion just went nuts and it was one of those where you kind of shrug and go, well, Zion, Zion, and uh, oh, yeah, and the Pelicans attempted 40 free throws. The Wolves attempted 19. This was one of those games that was just poorly officiated in general, and Zion was really, really hot. Like, take out his free throws. The dude was still 13 of 17 from the field. Um, so it was equal parts Zion being Zion and the refs being the refs, and those things combined, it, it's insurmountable. I mean, Minnesota was, you know, played New Orleans even on the glass in that game. They actually didn't have turnover issues. They only turned it over 11 times Minnesota did in that game. Uh, I thought in general played okay. Uh, it was just they couldn't stop Zion Williamson. Nas had a good game off the bench. Cat was fine. Um, oh, and also Anthony Edwards didn't play in that game. I completely forgot. That was the game Anthony Edwards missed too. So that also contributes. Why are the Wolves six and a half point favorites against New Orleans? Well, a couple reasons. One, Ant didn't play the last time out. The Wolves lost by 14 on the road. Two, New Orleans played on Tuesday night. They beat the Brooklyn Nets in Brooklyn. Pretty easily. It was a wire-to-wire -wire win for them. 
And uh, three, the Wolves haven't lost consecutive games all season long. And I guarantee you that's factoring into this line here. And the Wolves, by the way, have only lost once at home all season. That Kings game back in early November, the in-season tournament game. So Minnesota's home record, the fact they haven't lost two in a row, Pelicans traveling, um, playing the night before. The Wolves have been home for a day. And also Ant is playing in this game. The Wolves beat the Pels the first two times around, but there was no McCollum and no Zion in those games. Last time out, no Ant for Minnesota. I, the line still feels a bit hefty to me. I was expecting it to be more in the three and a half, four range, honestly, which I don't know. I, six and a half is a lot. Um, unless there's an assumption that Zion doesn't play in the second end of a back-to-back, which is entirely possible in which case. Um, but, but then again, like the importance of this game, if you're new Orleans, if they win, there's no tiebreaker advantage for Minnesota. If Minnesota wins. They have the tiebreaker advantage. And at this point, New Orleans is only like four and a half games behind Minnesota in the West. Like it's, it's not out of the question that that could come into play here. Uh, down the stretch in, in April. So um, I'd be a little surprised if New Orleans didn't kind of go all out here and try and win this game. But um, at any rate, the Wolves are six and a half point favorites. Per usual, you, you look at this matchup and, and you just, you worry about Valanciunas inside. You worry about the Pelicans ability to rebound the basketball on both ends of the floor with Zion and with Valanciunas. And then also the foul trouble uh, or well, yeah, individual foul trouble for the Wolves and just the free throw rate for New Orleans. I mean, they're top 10 in the league in terms of free throw rate. They're actually top five in terms of offensive free throw rate. They're not a great three point shooting team. They're relatively league average in terms of percentage, but they don't shoot that many threes. It's more about getting to the line, doing damage in the paint, grabbing offensive rebounds, all things that the wolves kind of intermittently have struggled with this season. So I don't love the matchup for Minnesota. If Zion doesn't play, the Wolves should win this thing easily. If he does, um, it's going to be a close game. I, I think six and a half is too high if everybody plays. I think this thing is probably a one or two possession game when it all when it's all said and done uh, Wednesday night. Of course, we'll have the live postcast over at Locked On Sports Minnesota on YouTube following the game. And we will have the, the postgame podcast posted early Thursday morning. Um, the next uh, show in your feed, actually, on audio for Locked On Wolves will be the Minnesota Basketball Party. Myself, Jack Borman, the editor-in-chief over at Kata Supis, Reggie Wilson, the Care 11 sports anchor, and uh, Ron Johnson, the Ron Johnson show, plus Sam Ekstrom of Locked On Minnesota will be on your feed here later today, possibly even now, depending on when you're listening. The next feed, the next in your audio feed, if you're on YouTube, hop over to Locked On Sports Minnesota and check out the Minnesota basketball party. We do it every Wednesday. Uh, besides, we just missed last Wednesday for the holidays, but uh, we're back on it now every single Wednesday. And then again, the live postcast, same place, Locked On Sports Minnesota on YouTube the audio feed here at Locked On Wolves. And then this show will be back Thursday morning with the Locked On Wolves postgame podcast uh, will be Thursday's show after Wolves Pelicans. A big thank you for making Locked On Wolves your first listen every single day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. You can also watch on the Locked On Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Locked On T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two Bs, two E's, CK. Yeah, of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.